Scott. So, any questions? See one of them. Oh no, actually, I'm sorry. That was twenty seven. That was just two weeks ago. Weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. Six weeks ago. Yes. Oh my goodness. Who was behind that? A man. I don't think because I had to send out a revised packet 24 hours before the meeting. Okay. okay. So, but um, I sat in on the meeting this morning. So the experts. Are they just? Uh, so it's like I don't really need the, the bills. Yeah, just that. Just, just, just yeah, I'll mention it. 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 I'll I see Lori as well. So we have no consent items. Council member, um, Council member um, Durinsky and Council member Zavani, do you have any changes to the minutes? Yeah. Okay, we'll approve those. Um, and we'll go ahead with our federal legislative update. Lori, I see you. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? We're doing well. Um, I was telling, I was just texting you, Liz. I'm taking care of my nieces right now. I'm in their playroom. And trust me, you do not want to see the background right now. It's a little crazy. So I'm going to go on video to spare you. Um, they're, they're all their toys and mess. Um, re Congress is in recess right now after a really busy March. When they come back, they're going to begin drafting appropriation bills. So that's what we're going to know for um, if our earmark requests are included in there. Right now, Liz and I are working on um, having HUD um, visit Aurora, following up on um, the city council members and mayor's uh, visit to HUD headquarters. Um, they told us that they're going to be in the area during the cities at Summit in Denver on April 26th and 28th. And they reached out to us and the Assistant Secretary of Intergovernmental Affairs, Dr. Kimberly McLean, would like to hopefully visit Aurora and see some of the projects you're working on related to housing and how we're using our COVID funding. So we're working on that right now and hopefully it'll come to fruition. In addition, a rural water is coming in town in two weeks. So we're going to go and visit the congressional delegation um, and talk about all the great things um, that the city is doing on water conservation, including the turf project. So short update right now, I should have more when they return in um, a week and a half. So any questions? Mm -hmm. There's no questions from me. Any questions from the committee? Councilmember Jarinski, Councilmember Zavonik? None. There's none. Lori. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Okay, you too. Thank you. Okay, bye. okay, our federal state legislative update. So, Lori, I mean, um, Peggy. <laughs> Sorry, Peggy. No, that's okay. We're zipping through. Okay. Um, Good afternoon. Um, legislature has four weeks left on Monday. Um, the House completed the budget this week and the Senate the previous week. So the Joint Budget Committee will meet next week in Conference Committee to finalize um, the budget and the orbital bills that are associated with it. Um, we will then have kind of a quick sprint to the end of session. A lot of bills that Aurora is still following. Um, the biggest was up last night. I shouldn't say the biggest, but a big one was up last night. Senate Bill 213, which is the land use legislation. Um, the committee hearing went till 1115 last night. The bill was laid over. The sponsors are going to work on amendments to the bill. Um, we saw some drafts of some general concepts, but nothing that I would imagine would remove the opposition of the city of Aurora. Um, <coughs> Huge turnout, 260 witnesses, a lot of concerns expressed by local governments on the bill. Um, 
And so a lot of work to do on that bill in the next four weeks. We've also reached out and spoken with both Senator Buckner and Senator Fields on the legislation expressing concerns. Um, Liz and her team put together a list of potential amendments that we have shared with both those legislators as well as the bill sponsor um, and hoping to get some one on one time um, with the majority leader who's the bill sponsor on it to walk through those amendments. Um, in terms of other leg and I happy to answer any questions on that one. Maybe I should just pause there for a second. Okay, is there any questions from Councilmember Zavonik and Councilmember Jarinski on the bill? I was listening to it on and off all day yesterday, and so I heard different various testimony. Liz was probably more on it than I was, so. Yes, lots of interesting testimony. They did something very interesting where instead of one person at a time, they did panels. Um, so it was a panel in opposition and then in a panel of support. Um, it was very long. They actually ended up cutting people's time towards midway through. Um, uh, the mayor did provide testimony and around, I would say, 3.50 p.m. and the meeting started at 11. Uh, so if you are looking for where that is, that's kind of the general time frame of it all. Um, it went quite well, but as noted, this was more of a stakeholder listening session than it was really any kind of votes or um, changes to the legislation at this time. Sure. I would just, just for this committee's awareness, uh, Dr. Cog, uh, I sit on that board for the city and they, we voted on Wednesday night to actively oppose. Thank you so much. And they had great testimony too, Councilman. Oh, they good. did a nice job. Yeah, they, they, they turned that around quickly because originally yeah. the recommendation was to be neutral. Interesting. Is there any other questions? from? Okay, and then Liz, I know that you provided some amendments that I got, mm -hmm. but we haven't gave them. Have they been to the committee? What? Um, no, I couldn't put them in the packet as if I got them too late for the 24 hour deadline okay. was when okay. they were sent to me. Okay. Um, these are not to note. These are very conceptual. There's no actual bill language in these amended changes. Um, they're just pretty conceptual about strengthening affordability, revising some things, um, providing additional flexibility, but there is nothing concrete to report on. Well, I would like probably like the committee just to get them yep. just so we can all be on the same page. Mm -hmm. so. Because um, I got them, but I just want to make sure Council Member Zavodic and Council Member Jorinsky get some as well. Of course. Okay. And we should be getting some more concrete amendments, um, hopefully early next week. So we'll ship those off to Liz as well as soon as we get those. Okay. A um, couple other bills I was just going to highlight for you. Um, Senate Bill 75, the deletion of a child's name from criminal justice records. Um, that bill passed Senate Judiciary, still parked in Senate Appropriations. Senate Bill 97, the Motor Vehicle Theft Bill, um, passed out of the Senate and is assigned to House Judiciary. 1132, the Court Data Sharing Task Force, um, that has passed out of Senate Judiciary. Um, and is scheduled for Senate appropriations on April 11th. Um, Judge Day came down and testified on the bill and did a fabulous job as always. Um, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about that when we get to that point, as well as 1222, which is the cases of domestic violence in municipal courts. That will be heard in judiciary on April 11th. I did get another text message or email from Representative um, Weissman that we should be getting amendments on that ASAP. Um, so I'll be sure to turn those around real quick and get those out to the team as soon as we get those. Senate Bill 111, which is the Public Employees Workplace Protection. Um, this is scheduled for Senate appropriations on April 11th as well. Um, we are reaching out to Senators Buckner and Fields to try to get local governments exempted from that bill. Um, it's going to be challenging, but we'll do our best to try to push on that. Um, this bill, unfortunately, hasn't gotten as much 
Um, I think there's just so many tough bills down at the legislature. Um, it doesn't seem to have gotten as much traction in terms of opposition as I would have hoped, but um, we'll keep pounding away on it. Um, so those are the big ones that are hanging out there right now. I know Liz is going to go through some of the bills that have been introduced. One other um, bill I wanted to highlight for you guys. Um, there is a workers' comp bill that is expected to be introduced um, maybe next week. Um, small chance that maybe the speaker doesn't introduce it. It's been on hold for a while, but it will dramatically change um, the way that uh, caps and the schedule for payment is allocated right now in workers' comp. Um, we'll... I, Liz, I'm not sure if I've sent you the latest draft of that bill, but I will do that uh, just so you've got it at the top of your email. But I'm knowing where HR has been on some of these work comp bills in the past, um, it might be something they're going to suggest to weigh in on. So just wanted to highlight that one for you. Is it is that it from your Peggy from your? I think that's it for right now. There's several other bills that we're watching, but those are um, some of the highlights of what's going on. Okay, Cami and Totsi, do you have any additional comments? Yeah, we're expecting that Cora bill to drop in, in the next week as well. And I've sent that to Liz and Katie. So when that officially comes out, we'll let you all know. Thank you all for doing your all the hard work down there. I know it's kind of a interesting session for sure with a lot going on. So appreciate you all. Okay, is there any questions for um, our lobbying team? Okay, we're gonna move forward and it looks like we're gonna go with Judge Day. Judge Day, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, as, as it relates to 1132, um, it was great to see Stephanie Bill Barte, who's with the Office of Child Protection on Munsman um, there. Um, it was great to connect with her. She also testified in front of Senate Judiciary in support of this bill. Um, we had conversations way back in 2018 about this specific topic of creating a way for courts to share information. So that's how long ago we started these conversations. And she was there. Um, she proposed an amendment, which I um, personally support. And that is to add additional people to the task force, one being a representative from her office, the Office of Child Protection Ombudsman, a representative from Department of Human Services, and a representative from the sex assault community or from a domestic violence victim rights community. I think that they would um, add a lot to the to the task force, and so I personally supported that, and, I, and that was um, passed out of Senate Judiciary. It's on to appropriations. As to Wednesday was a was a big day for some criminal justice bills down at the Capitol um, in front of House Judiciary. That committee hearing started at 1.30 and didn't end until about 1.45 Thursday morning. The big bill was 12.49 and, and we refer to it as raise the age for um, criminal culpability for juveniles. Um, there were over a hundred, I believe there was over a hundred witnesses that were allowed to testify in front of the committee. Um, it did pass out of House Judiciary on a 9-4 vote. It's on to appropriations. Really what it means is that kids who are 10, 11, and 12 cannot be charged criminally for any criminal act. There is one carve out and that's for homicide. That's the only carve out. So there was a lot of testimony as it relates to um, the impact of this bill, uh, even out sex assaults and other things that that uh, kids could not be criminally charged. Um, a lot of, I thought, very powerful testimony from a lot of different groups, um, but yet it was passed nine four and it is going forward. So happy to answer any questions about this committee's uh, concerns about that bill. Um, 1169, which was the bill that um, Rep. Bacon was sponsoring, and that is non-arrest for low-level offenses. That was postponed indefinitely on um, the 5th. 
actually turned over into the sixth. So that won't be going forward in this legislative session. Um, you can anticipate that it would be back probably next year, though, in some form, some some way. The other one that was of great consequence, I think, from the Wednesday's session was um, remote public access for criminal court proceedings. Again, it passed on a unanimous vote, but there was a lot of testimony as to the concerns from really the three perspectives in the criminal justice system, state judicial, the prosecution, the defense, um, regarding um, how and how can we guarantee uh, and protect the record, protect victims, um, but yet again, it made it out of the committee and it's going forward as well. It's to the House um, floor vote because there's not an appropriations tag to it. So happy to answer any questions about that as well. Council Member Kierinski. So um, that's really upsetting about both of those bills, actually, to hear that. Um, the juvenile one, so with it making it out of committee, um, and there's no testimony allowed, right, when it goes forward? There's like nothing else you can do? It, typically not, okay. um, but it's still just in one side. It's, all, it's still in the House, okay. so there would be opportunity if, it, if and when it does make its way to the Senate. Okay, will you, um, will you just keep us posted on that? And then Judge Day, on that one, I have a concern because with that, they can only just be convicted of homicide. I can see people, older people, using these kids as mules sure. to do some of the dirty work and the crimes because they're not going to be convicted. And that's that's really a big problem. Do they not understand that? Are they looking at that side? Is that something that could be brought up? I mean, that's what's happening now, but that's really going to be happening. If they can only be convicted on homicide, I could see these older people, you know, people just using these kids to do crimes. Yeah. It, it so I'm sorry if I'm a little passionate, oh, about, but it's kind of frustrating to me. There's a lot of passion that goes into this specific topic. And so it's, it's, it's great that you're picking up on that because that, that was testified in front of the committee about the potential impacts of, of this and. Uh, and then what was, can I just ask, what was the committee's response? Did they just say, we realized that or? There were, there were groups that came forward after that was raised and, and rebutted the, that concern. Um, and their, their position was is that that still they shouldn't be subject to criminal prosecution even when they were being recruited or being used by the adults the commission of adult crimes right so um again it was a very passionate debate um, that was presented before the committee there's a lot of passion as it went into the vote as well um and it, it made it out of committee nine four vote so that's just, I mean, I don't understand what people are not looking at our landscape and what's going on with our kids right now. There was a lot of discussion I about mean, potential carve outs in addition to just homicide and one being sex assault because yeah. there's a lot of testimony as it relates to these types of crimes, well, um, family on family, you know, incest type of scenarios, um, kids at schools and such. And I think there wasn't a lot I thought there would be more uh, testimony coming from schools and the impact of schools and the, the safety impact of schools. Um, maybe that will come forward in the Senate. But I don't know. Yeah, it just seems like there's no consequence. I know these kids are young, but there's like a lot of these kids aren't like back when I went to school. They're not even scared of the scared straight program. We had that. I mean, I wasn't, but I'm just saying yep. it's just. There's no consequence, so they're just going to be like, well, I'll just do it and I'll just have the person. I, I'm just frustrated with that. There's just no consequence all over. Period to me on this, so that's just my personal opinion. I don't know if you have a comment on what I'm saying and. Yeah, actually, my comment would be that um, I'm kind of confused because it seems contradictory to say that you have the mental culpable state at, um, to you know, commit murder. Sorry, just 
but not some of the lower level offenses, um, you know, anything less than that. So it uh, seems contradictory to me. Um, so I think we need to try and mobilize to go in front of the Senate. Try to do something. I hope that the word will start to get out about this bill forward so that more people will have an opportunity to, to voice their concerns. It'll probably have to be on the Senate side. Those the sponsors? Um, believe it or not, it has bipartisan sponsorship right really? now. Uh, Rep. Armbrugost was one of the sponsors. Okay. He's up in Weld, Ryan Armbrugost. Um, Serena Gonzalez, Gutierrez in the House, and then Senator Simpson and Senator Coleman, Senate side. Senator Coleman? Okay. Yeah, Coleman and Simpson in the Senate side. Okay. Any questions? Professor Bonnet for Judge Dady updates. Okay. Thank you, Judge Dady. I appreciate it. Okay. And all you, you're doing down at the Capitol, too, <sighs> or on our issues. So I appreciate you. Okay, Liz, it's on you. Great. So we have a number of bills to get through today. Um, so we'll start with actively support. The first one is Senate Bill 23249, false reporting of an emergency. So this bill would add the false reporting of a mass shooting or active shooter uh, in a public or private space um, as a class six felony. And then um, in addition to that, a class one misdemeanor if the threat causes the occupants of a building um, to shelter in order or uh, to implement protocol on behalf of a report. Um, staff is recommending to actively support that legislation. Recommending a misdemeanor for anybody who causes an entire school to shelter in place. So it would add false reporting of a mass shooter or active shooter in a public or private place or vehicle um, that transfers people or property as a class six felony. So the bill specifies that a false reporting of an emergency is a class one misdemeanor if the threat causes the occupants of a building, place of assembly, or facility to be issued a shelter in place order. So the woman who recently uh, made false allegations, made a false report against me, was charged with a class four felony. I can't comment on that case. Um, I think I'm, a class six felony is pretty weak. That is what... The bill suggests um, the staff rationale, though, is that um, anything that would potentially disrupt or mitigate um, whatever this would be or the common occurrence of swatting uh, would be beneficial um, and that any kind of uh, uh, any kind of like judgment or opinion of justice um, would hopefully curb these incidences. Well, um, you know, my thought would be that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, shelter in place, I think we're talking about because people feel like there's going to be some violence against them. Something's going to happen. And so, um, you know, to say that would be a misdemeanor to me, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we can make misdemeanors, you know, when they're nonviolent, you know, I'm all for that. But when it comes to threats or things like that, I mean, those um, puts people in, you know, uh, um, fear of, you know, imminent bodily harm or death, and especially with all these incidents happening across the country, um, you know, it's serious. And I think most people are thinking, hey, it's not, it's going to happen here. You know, it's not, it's not if it's going to happen, it's when. To, so to say something, a situation, being put in that situation as a misdemeanor, um, I think that's, um, you know, that's um, minimizing uh, the situation. Um, so I'll, I'll clarify again. Um, so the false reporting of a mass shooting or active shooter would be a class six felony. But a um, false reporting of an emergency that causes someone to shelter in place would be a class one misdemeanor. So what type of example of an emergency would we be talking about? So if um, someone called in to a school with a threat that there was a mass shooter or active shooter and they were wrong or that was a false reporting of an emergency, that would be a class six felony. Uh, however, if you falsify an emergency that causes them to shelter in place, or um, in a place of assembly, then, or that threat results in the um, initiation of a standard response protocol in response to a threat, that would be a class one misdemeanor. What's currently the charge for calling in a bomb threat? I do not know. That would be helpful. I mean, wouldn't that be the same if you call in a bomb threat on a school or if you call in a mass shooter? Is that a class six felony for calling in a bomb threat? 
you can have find out and get back to you. Um, and so we're saying false reporting. So if I believe there's a active shooter, but there's not really that I would be a believe, misdemeanor. I believe if it's I actually if you intentionally it. call it in to you intentionally call in a mass shooting or active shooter when there is not. That's like that's still that's putting threat. Yeah, that's the same. Yeah. So it looks like on this one, because we need some more information, I don't think that we should be taking actively support at this time. That's the how does my colleagues feel? Councilman Jawinski, Councilman Spanik. Yeah, I mean, this feels kind of weak to me, and I would like to know what the charge is for calling in a bomb threat. Okay. Councilman Yeah, you want to take more to, of a monitor position? Yeah, right? I'm inclined to want to support it, but I think monitor until we get more information okay. is fine. So, Liz, we're going to take a monitor position on this until we get the more information based on the questions that Councilmember Jawinski proposed. Uh, the next bill is House Bill 23 1259 open meetings law executive session violations. So this would allow a local public body or municipality to cure any violations of the open meetings law with respect to an executive session. Um, if the public body takes a corrective action at the next meeting, um, so staff is recommending actively support as this would allow home rule municipalities, which found themselves in violation, a way to correct that violation by the next meeting and not have to go through any litigation or legal proceedings. Is there any questions for Liz? And do you support the city's position of actively support? Councilmember Jurinsky, Councilmember Zabot. Yeah, I support it. I support as well. And then just to know, um, this all begins on page 16 of the documents. I'm sorry, I did not mention that earlier. Uh, so the next section um, are a couple support if asked bills. So the first one is Senate Bill 23201, Minimal Mineral Resources Property Owners Rights. So the bill addresses several different issues regarding pooling and forced pooling of oil and gas and mineral interests, which would affect the mineral owners. And the Senate Aurora is one of those owners. Um, we do have staff here, Jeffrey Moore, to answer questions of the uh, committee. Um, so the position recommended recommendation is support if asked and to uh, pursue an amendment. So there is a section of the bill that would allow a jurisdiction to deny pooling rights um, if they were a municipality. So as Aurora has interest in other jurisdictions, we could prohibit or block any pooling that goes on. However, the same thing is true for us. If another municipality has mineral rights in our jurisdiction, they could also stop any pooling or mineral rights. Um, I will turn it over to Jeff Moore to provide additional context on this as he is the expert. Wait, what, what, just a question for you. Just a, um, on this. Um, the support is asked and pursue an amendment to change. I have one that 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 yesterday, so we just included the packet. It's not included because it would have been nice to have the, a summary, but. Um, because we don't have the summary, can you just give a summary yes. of what that summary was you were going to hand out to us? And then we'll ask questions from there because I didn't see the summary. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, council members and staff. Jeffrey Moore, manager of the oil and gas division. So there are some uh, provisions in this bill that affect all mineral owners, including uh, the city of Aurora, and they provide what I believe are some benefits uh, and some improvements on the existing uh, law. The first is it recognizes the uniqueness of local governments and schools and entities that may have used public funds to acquire minerals. Uh, they don't currently have a choice regarding oil and gas minerals except to sign a lease. Uh, and they cannot legally enter into a multi-year agreement required by forced pooling. The uh, bill requires the operator to prove uh, by a third party that they do have 45% of minerals before they can be allowed to force pool. That is the, the requirement under COGC uh, rules and regulations. Uh, this would just require them to use a third party to demonstrate that they do legally have that 45% in order to, to meet that hurdle to uh, begin the force pooling application. Uh, it requires the commission, the oil and gas conservation commission to determine if uh, other, if there's a pooled area that includes uh, willing participants and, and non-consent participants, uh, can the willing participants minerals be extracted uh, in a logical manner without disturbing the non-consent minerals? And if they can, then the commission would have to rule on that and ask the operator to or require the operator to only extract the willing participants minerals. Uh, if not, then they would have to state that uh, up front. The bill requires the operator to pool minerals before drilling and producing a well, rather than the current option, which would right now they can drill the well first and then apply for pooling uh, separately later. 
So we require them to do this before they do the drilling. And then finally, it allows a non-consenting mineral owner to audit the operator every three years. I think most of these are, are very reasonable and I would support them. There are two items that I think are of, of concern as written in the current bill. The first is that it categorically, categorically excludes local governments and uh, school districts from being force pooled. So this um, may have some benefits for some jurisdictions. I think on the whole, it provides essentially a veto power to local governments and uh, school districts. Even if they have one acre of minerals within a thousand acre unit, uh, they could potentially stop the drilling of that unit. It also doesn't address the situation uh, which Liz mentioned, which is the fact that local governments can own minerals outside of their jurisdictional boundaries. For example, the city of Aurora owns mineral interests and gets royalties in Wealth County from purchases by Aurora Water over time. So I don't think it's reasonable that we would be able to make decisions as a local government in Wealth County for what's going on there simply because we own it. Likewise, another jurisdiction could come to Aurora, they could purchase mineral interest here, and then they would, by this bill, they would have the right to say, no, this area can't be drilled uh, under this pool because we, another jurisdiction, own mineral rights in this particular area within the jurisdictional boundaries of the city of Aurora. The last part is currently there is a provision uh, in the CGC, uh, actually in the state law, uh, regarding the uh, penalty that goes to a non-consenting uh, financial partner. So essentially, if the operator wants to drill the well and they have other financial partners in the well, generally they would all participate in the financial cost equally according to the share of their ownership of, of the leases. Um, if one party uh, wants to not participate, in other words, not pay for the cost of the drilling of the well, they can allow the operator to drill the well, pay the full cost for drilling the well, then the operator gets to recover two times all of their cost before the other party comes back in uh, as, an, as an equal owner. This bill would, re would reduce that from two times to one time, so from 200% to 100%. So if you think about that in terms of uh, other industries outside of oil and gas, if you had two financial partners in building anything, a hotel, apartment complex or something, you're basically letting the second, uh, the, the lesser owner, the smaller owner, participate in the project, get a free look to see if it's going to be successful before they then come back into uh, the project's a financial partner. I think the two times it's in current law is, is more appropriate, um, and it will drive people to work together and operators to work together uh, as they've been doing for, for decades. Okay, so you have the supportive ask and pursue amendment. So based on, you, you brought up some concerns. So are you sure, are you thinking that these amendments that you're thinking about, that you just address these issues will be, I mean, an amendment? Because, I mean, it seems like there's some, some consequences as well, some things too in this bill, but you're like, it seems like you might have some reassurance that you might be able to pursue some amendment, amendments. I would I would like to pursue amendments. I think that would be the wise thing to do. Uh, a very a simple amendment would be at first limiting a local government's um, ability to avoid force pooling to within their jurisdictional area. So not that we could go and buy minerals somewhere else and say no, or someone else could come here and buy minerals and say no. That it would be limited to within the city limits, for example, of Aurora. Follow up to that. And, sure. and it seems to me that even if we owned, say, in a certain area, 10% or 20%, so it wasn't enough, and the other 70 or 80% said yes, we shouldn't be able to. I don't believe the city should be able to stop force pulling um, if everybody else, if we have that small percentage. So I think that I mean, my personal view of this is that we should do the exact opposite of what's being recommended and say we oppose if asked and pursue those amendments. Um, that you would that you had suggested, and even like I said, take it a step further and say local government shouldn't be able to stop force pulling. Now, if we own seventy percent, and as a local government we decided to, that's that's different. Sure. If we're a, a, a minority interest in minerals, and we don't like it, we shouldn't be able to stop it. Well, what's your thoughts on that, though? Yeah, I agree with that. I think amendments need to be made to the to the bill. Okay, uh, for sure. Uh, the term that we use here, that's your committee's decision on what how to pursue that. Okay. I definitely think that there needs to be amendments. Uh, to the language that's in the bill currently. Okay, so um, we'll go with the opposed if asked, unless we have 
you know, pursuing other amendments. Would the committee agree to that, changing the position of what yeah, we have here? Yeah, we, yeah, we need to. Okay. So let's do that, Liz, on that one. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, the next bill is Senate Bill 23207, Sales and Use Tax Refund for Data Center Purchases. Um, so it allow data center businesses or a data center collector or center operator to claim a refund of all um, state sales and use tax. Um, so the, yes. It's your bill, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Watch that, Wendy. Um, Watch that, Wendy. Yeah, so we do have Wendy Mitchell here yeah. uh, to provide some additional information to the committee. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, essentially, um, again, as Liz mentioned, the bill is designed to help Colorado recruit data centers. One of the things that um, we've noticed over the last few years is we are unable to compete with other states to get data centers here. Um, in the one page handout that I um, submitted, if you look at Arizona, Texas, Wyoming, Illinois, Nebraska, all of those states have significant incentives that are offered. And in terms of an industry that Colorado should want, um, this is something that we want. And one of the things that um, Aurora Economic Development Council has been working on the last few years is we came to the city of Aurora, as well as Adams and Arapahoe County to be able to compete and say, okay, well, is it possible for us to do an automatic incentive? And that's a way for us to be able to get these folks and not get thrown out in the first round. So the bill basically is designed to meet a number of thresholds um, for the applicant. So they have to have a minimum number of employees of 10. It has to be, we're working on some amendments now with OEDIT. But um, the, the, the initial draft shows 25 million and up um, in terms of dollars. And there's, there's a, a bunch of different thresholds, a number of years that they have. It will sunset after um, 10 years. OADT, OADIT wants a few less years, but so there is a sunset to it. Um, they have to meet all these thresholds. They have to be approved by um, State Office of Economic Development to then receive the certificate. Then after that, and after the building is built, then they can compete to, they can apply to receive the rebate. And it's one of the reasons that we thought it was important is I think it will bring more data centers to Colorado, but more importantly, um, it allows the city of Aurora, Arapaho and Adams to have a partner and not to have to give as much as much as much incentives as they would have if we did not have a service okay. partner. So thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Um, do you have any questions for Wendy? Wendy, on this book. The question before us is if we support if asked, does the committee support that position? Yeah, I mean I I think we should actively support it. Yeah. Uh, I think this is an industry that we it, it can take this burden of um, these sales tax incentives off of the local level and bring the state in as a partner. I think that absolutely has an impact on the city. And I think that I do think that this is an industry that, <coughs> that I think that we should actively support it. Okay, so Councilmember Dorinsky brought up that we should change the position from supportive ask to actively support. Councilmember Zavani, do you support that? Yeah. Okay, I support that as well. We'll change it to active. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so if you want to finish staying with our meeting, you can, but. <laughs> Thank you. You can go. Okay, go okay, ahead, Liz. Next one. Uh, House Bill 23-1253, Task Force to Study Corporate Housing Ownership. So this bill would create a task force uh, on corporate housing ownership in the Division of Housing um, and bring those recommendations and findings back to the state. Um, so this also include, may include recommendations pertaining to imposing fees on corporations that own a significant number of homes. Um, so uh, staff has recommended support of us as several council members have raised concerns of corporations buying homes in this area and this legislation and creation of the task force could identify areas of concern or determine the extent of the issue. Okay, um, Jessica, I see you're here. Do you have any comments? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but just if you have, you're in housing and do you have any comments? I don't really have anything else to add besides okay. what was just noted. Okay. Um, it's just, you know, we have 
good landlords and not so good landlords. And so just keeping some consistency there um, for folks. Um, but this one is really looking at that corporate level, both from a multifamily and the ownership piece. Okay. Is there any questions? Council Member Jarensky. Yeah, so I remember some years back, uh, there something was brought forward to try and ban uh, Zillow from buying any more homes. Does that ring a bell to you? I, re I remember, I remember a conversation. Big, yeah, so there was talks about banning uh, Zillow from buying any more homes. I don't, I'm not supportive of that, but I'm also not supportive of any fees. Um, I can't support that. I mean, um, and and this is a tough place to be. And I'm in real estate myself, and I and I, I see you know these these big corporations open door and Zillow, and I mean there's tons of them that come in and buy up all these homes. I I think I would rather see like some sort of annual cap, um, than than putting fees on. Them. I mean they already own these homes, right? They already own these homes. So at, before any legislation, I I don't think it's fair for us to come in now and start implementing fees. I would personally rather see like some sort of an annual cap for these corporations on like how many um, how many homes that they could buy. I think that would be much more beneficial in the real estate market. I wouldn't support a supportive pass. I'd rather it's just either be neutral. This is gonna be a task force, so it's not anything substantial. Uh, I'd just say be neutral or monitor. Okay, well, I support this. I mean, I think Councilman Jarinski, you bring up a good point about having the cap and I would be willing to have that amendment, but if I, I think annual that cap, an yeah. annual cap, but I do think that these hedge funds and these corporations are coming in and they're raising rents on people. This is not only happening here in Colorado, but it's happening all over the country. So I, I've been an advocate and have actually complained about this. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't be against it. So it looks like we have um, um, a couple different things. Maybe here. for some clarity. So there isn't a, uh, are in this bill that would impose a cap, it there could be recommendations to imposing a fee. No, um, I mean, I can't, but I, can't. I mean, there's not recommendations. This isn't, it's just creation of a task force. Yeah, I can't do the fee. So I could be neutral, you know, monitor for amendments and see if they were open to any kind of conversations about that. But I can't get on board with any, with the fees. We this could bring it to a study session and essentially just say the council was, the FSR committee was, to neutral and your support and just take the temperature of the rest of the council at study session. That's the best thing to do work? on that one. Okay, we'll okay. do that. Now on to actively oppose. Uh, so the first bill is Senate Bill 23200 Automated Vehicle Identification Systems. So this bill would re change the required time frame to provide notice of an automated vehicle system violation from 90 to 30 days. Um, there are a lot of concerns within the city for this and staff is recommending actively opposed as the city is currently in the final stages of setting up photo speed enforcement program. Um, and we, to, in, to facilitate this program, the city has already changed multiple ordinances um, and gone through that process with council. Um, so to have these types of changes would require staff and council to revisit these ordinances to ensure they would be in compliance. Um, in addition to that, it also changes the time frame to provide notification um, to 30 days, uh, which many staff believe is unreasonable and too short of a time frame in order to provide proper notices and review footage for violations. Um, there are several other uh, concerns as noted in the rationale, but I will pause there and see if there are any additional questions. Any questions? Do you support the um, staff's position of actively imposed? Yeah. No. Okay, I do as well. Moving forward, um, the next bill is a change in position recommendation from staff, House Bill 231102, Alcohol and Drug Impaired Driving Enforcement. Um, this bill was the creation of a grant program. However, a recent amendment was adopted to exclude any law enforcement agency that is subject to a judicially ordered consent decree. Staff is recommending to revise the position from support if asked to actively oppose, uh, as the rationale is that um, uh, grant funding should targeting specific criminal activity should not be tied to whether um, a jurisdiction is under a consent decree or not. Yeah, and I know that Pete, Pete Schulte, are you still on the call? Because I know that he reached out to Phil Weiser directly about this, and it sounds like before it even is heard, it sounds like there's going to be that's going to be taken out the mm -hmm. consent decree. Or Pete, are you on the call still? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So 
the amendment did pass committee with little fanfare because it was not done in advance. And so my understanding was for it to be adopted, it's got to go before the full house, uh, but it did make it into the bill. It's going to the full house floor. So I think um, the time to, to combat this is when it goes over to the Senate um, and goes to committee over there. Um, but yeah, they stuck this in and they, they added actually three things. One was simply having policies and procedures regarding the grant funding. The second was complying with the contact data reporting uh, that Senate Bill 217 and, and uh, that required. And the third thing was now they added not being under a, a judicially ordered consent decree. Um, so when I talked to Phil Weiser in his office, they're against this. They didn't know about it. Um, I know uh, Chief Morris and Chief Acevedo are against this because, you know, these, these are collateral consequences that we didn't expect and we feel like we're being singled out. If we had known this was going to happen, uh, we would have we would have changed things uh, more a couple of years ago. So uh, that's why I, I brought this forward to, to ask the committee to allow us to actively oppose because uh, this is this isn't right. I agree. With that. I agree as well. So we'll take the new position of actively opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Next bill is House Bill 23-1245, Campaign Practices for Municipal Elections. Um, so this bill would set aggregate limits on contributions to candidates for municipal offices, um, as well as limits. Uh, will, these limits would be periodically adjusted for infl inflation. However, the bill would also prohibit a political party from making any contributions to a candidate as well. Staff is recommending actively oppose as in the constitution provide the state constitution provides home rule municipalities um, with the authority to legislate on matters pertaining to municipal elections as well as in 2020 aurora did pass a comprehensive campaign finance code addressing contributions and limits already um, so if these pass it would also it would not only be a violation of our home rule but we would also have to go back and change ordinances that have already been worked on and decided upon is there any questions from the committee no. to support the, the city's position of activity post? post? Yeah. I do as well. Um, almost done. So uh, House Bill 23-1249, reduced justice involvement for young children. This is a bill that Judge Day had previously mentioned during his um, discussion. Um, so as he uh, provided insight on the bill would require every county to participate in a local collaborative management program um, for children 10 to 12 years in age uh, and changes the minimum age of a child subject to court jurisdiction. Staff is recommending actively oppose on this bill um, as it would have a negative impact to community safety and school safety and then impact the ability of the court to provide early intervention. Just, uh, I think we are talked about this, but we actively oppose. And the uh, last bill, House Bill 23-1255, regulating local ho housing growth restrictions. So this bill would preempt any existing local housing, housing growth restriction and forbid the enactment or enforcement of any future local housing growth restriction. Um, there has been two amendments adopted defining anti-growth law and providing one exemption in the incident of a disaster emergency as noted by the governor. Um, so even with those amendments, staff is still recommending actively oppose as it would infringe on municipal home rule powers. Um, and it does not take into consideration the need for infrastructure or um, uh, any infrastructure that would need to be built in new areas. In addition, this also may affect the city's ability to decide how to implement housing strategy. Does the committee support the city's position of actively oppose? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we do as well. Um, I thought I saw, I, I guess I saw in my third council room in front of my um, speak, so. Um, okay, is that it for our That's bills? everything. Okay, so um, Kathy, um, the water update, you want us to do a, a letter of support request? Yes, please. Um, so these are for annual appropriations. Uh, the Upper Colorado River Endangered Fish Recovery Program has been in existence since the late 1980s. Um, it's, it provides us with ESA compliance for all of our Colorado River sources. And so this is, um, we come to you every year with these annual support letters. And I could uh, go on and on for days about the program, 
So I'll just open it up for questions. I think everything is in the packet. Is there any questions from the committee and do you support these letters that were sent by water to you? Program letters. Okay. okay, we support them, Kathy, and we have no questions. Oh, thank you very much. And then I do have a couple informational items. Okay. Um, first, uh, with uh, Senate Bill 213 and with House Bill 1255, uh, the Water Department will match the FS FSIR positions. So um, thank you. And then uh, there is a bill, uh, House Bill 1282, Protect Consumers from Public Utilities, that was introduced this week. Its first hearing is up on April 20th before our next FSIR meeting. Um, I should have more uh, for you on this bill at the next meeting, but I may have to share um, some information with you via email between now and then. And uh, same also goes for Senate Bill 270 that was introduced on Wednesday. Um, its first hearing is on April 13th. And so just wanted to make you aware of those two bills um, that we couldn't quite get into today's packet. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, if there's nothing else, we have miscellaneous matters for consideration. Liz, I just want to bring up because of the committee members, when we have the in-person meetings, maybe if we could just have the summaries of these, because this is a lot of paper. Yeah. So maybe just have <laughs> like, we, we have the bills, we this. can link to the bills. All we need is yeah. this, like yeah. this whole portion I'm going to put back over there for recycling. Yeah. Yeah. So if we could just do that for when we have our in-person meetings, that would be great. Okay. Um, is there anything else from the committee? Okay, our next meeting is April 21st at 1 o'clock in open That's it. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bomb threat is a classic. Classic. Thank you, everybody yes. online. Calling in a bomb threat? So it's like, would you be equivalent? Adding those things to yeah. us. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah.